when I was smoking crack, I would smoke some, but I would frequently go two or three days before picking up the pipe again. But picture when you're hooked on food, there's really no place that you're free. You can't even go into a movie theater or like Everywhere is a conditioned reinforcer for eating addictively. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsy and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page. That's Switch, the number four, and then Good. And then click on groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group and tell us what you want. Well, hey, y'all. Here we are again. And We have a pretty awesome guest today that was with us way, 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 way back for episode 10, where we probably had 10 listeners, Alexander, don't you think? (laughs) Yeah, they missed out on her, so we had to have her come back. Although we've replayed her since on one of our Flashback Fridays, because we pick our favorite shows for Flashback Friday, and she was so great that we couldn't not play her again. This is true. This is true. She's really, she's really fantastic. So now we have millions of listeners. So that's going to be uh, exciting uh, for, for us because we're such a fan of Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson. And episode 10, uh, it was about managing food addiction and achieving healthy body weight. I think everyone that walks on planet Earth experiences the occasional food craving, right? But for some people, certain foods can become a true addiction. And one of the quotes that I pulled out from episode 10 that uh, Dr. Um, Thompson said was, this is what people who've never been really addicted to anything don't get. The addict isn't using to get high. The addict is using to get normal. And that is a profound statement. And we, we go into that uh, it, it fairly deeply in the episode uh, today. But if you, if, you, if you feel like you want to go back to episode 10 and listen to that first for the diehards, right? Uh, we go into the science behind food addiction. Everything that comes out of Dr. Thompson's mouth is evidence-based. And that's one of the many things we love about her. Um, episode 10 also talked about strategies to cope with food addiction, Uh, We went through her food philosophy and weight loss barriers. And then we talked about something called the compensation effect. Uh, So go back and listen to episode 10 if you so desire. But today, what are we going to get into, Alexandra? Well, she's written a new book uh, called Resume, and it talks a lot about um, relapsing, which is so important because people often, well, everybody nobody, we're human. So we're not perfect, right? We're not robots, robots. So if we have a food plan that works for us and we're feeling great, all of us go off it once in a while. The question is, and I always tell this to my, um, my coaching clients, it's not about how often you go off. What's more important is how fast you get on, get back on. Um, because we all deviate a little bit at some times and being perfect is not the goal. Uh, so having an overall healthy life is the goal. So that her book talks a lot about how to deal with relapses, which I think is uh, great. And the thing about Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson, which you'll hear more about in our first episode with her. So I highly recommend you going back is she has a history of addiction. She's not someone just standing up there in a white lab coat telling us how we should be. No, she speaks from experience serious drug issues, serious food issues. And now she really is what she calls happy, thin, and free 
through her program. And she also admits to relapsing. So she has a lot of personal experience and that's what makes her, even though she's also a neuroscientist, she really speaks in a way that I think we can all relate to. And that's why I'm such a fan of hers, really. So you can go, you don't have to, you can listen to that one first or after, but you know, I highly recommend. And we bring up the exercise thing in our show today also, the, and the compensation effect at the end of the show. So you can hear about that and why uh, Dr. what Dr. Tossin thinks about exercise, which might not be what you would expect. So, yeah, yeah. so yeah. I was really happy to have my, and I, I wasn't fangirling as much this time. I was really cool. She was cool too. <laughs> if you listen to the first episode, you'll know that she actually was very surprised to know that I was in a very favorite, important movie uh, from her childhood. Um, and I don't think this time, Dotsie, I don't think she knew. I don't think she remembered. I don't think she remembered she was on episode 10. Just going to say that. Yeah, I don't think she remembered think. us. No. And she didn't remember anything about how she got so like excited because I was in Christine and I was so excited about her too. So we were like, yeah, y'all met. school. Good. <laughs> Now we're just a boring old Alexandra and Dotsie for this 190th episode. Yes. Anyway, exactly. But anyway, y'all will really, really enjoy it. Today, we're excited to welcome Susan Pierce Thompson, PhD, back to the show. Susan is an expert in the psychology of eating and has shared so much with us about the science behind food addiction and addiction in general. Susan is an adjunct associate professor of brain and cognitive scientists at the University of Rochester, the president of the Institute for Sustainable Weight Loss, and CEO of Brightline Eating Solutions. She is dedicated to sharing the psychology and neuroscience of sustainable weight loss. On top of that, Susan is a successful published author. We spoke about her first book, Brightline Eating, The Science of Living Happy, Thin and Free, on episode 10. But now Susan is back at it again with her newest book, Resume. We can't wait to learn all about it and the tools that Susan shares with readers to transform their relationship with food, something that so many of us struggle with. Resume has been called, quote, life-saving for people who have struggled for years to unshackle themselves from the scourge of food addiction, unquote. So let's find out why. Susan, welcome to the program. Thanks, Alexandra. Thanks, Tatsi. So good to be back with you. So let's talk about addiction first. The Yale Food Addiction Scale, and you have your own susceptibility scale um, on your, uh, through your program and on your website. You both find that around 20% of the United States population is addicted to food. What does that mean to be addicted to food? Yeah, well, it means that um, people have cravings, like powerful cravings to eat, sometimes cravings that drive them out of their way to go satisfy those cravings. It means that when they start eating, they often lose control over how much they eat. So they might really intend to eat one piece of pizza or two pieces of pizza and end up eating way more than that. It means that when they eat an a sort of moderate, average, normal amount of food, often they don't feel satisfied. They want to keep eating. Um, it means that they um, are thinking about their food and their weight and their exercise a lot, whether they're on their plan or off their plan, how many miles, how many calories, how many pounds, um, is it's filling up their headspace to a degree that feels um, intrusive and unnecessary and unwanted. Um, it means that they have tried to control their eating and to solve their food problem multiple times with no lasting success. Um, that's, that's kind of the profile roughly. And, um, yeah, 20% full blown food addiction and easily a third of people, pretty bad food addiction and another third of people, moderate food addiction to the point where if they have weight to lose the degree of food addiction that they have in play is going to make that really hard for them to lose weight and keep it off. So really it's only one third of our population that is free and clear from food addiction kind of altogether. Two thirds are saddled with it to some degree. So it's a continuum. And when you take the, the susceptibility quiz for food addiction, you get a score from one to 10. And so really it's not that many people who are, you know, below four. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, you mentioned uh, one aspect, not feeling satisfied. In your research or the research that is out there, um, is there a disconnection between the brain and gut connection and communication with people that do not feel satisfied by any amount of, of food? It's not communicating to the gut. There, yes, there is, Dotsie. And um, a couple things that I want to highlight in relation to the severing of that communication. One is leptin resistance. So mm. leptin is the hormone that tells you that you're satisfied, that you're done eating, that you've had enough, that you're full. And that hormone of satiation um, isn't seen by the brain when there's leptin resistance. Oh. The leptin is um, in the bloodstream aplenty, actually, because the more you weigh, the more leptin your fat cells are releasing. Um, so you got plenty of leptin on board, but the brain isn't seeing it. And the brain literally thinks you're starving, even though um, you're clearly not. And mm -hmm. that produces what I call insatiable hunger. It's like this weird form of hunger that isn't satisfied by eating. You can have just had a huge dinner and then be sitting on the couch watching TV or reading a book and feel like you need a bag of chips and then you need some ice cream and you need to keep eating. Even though if you check in with your stomach, you can feel that it's full. You know that there's the stretch receptors are, are registering that you're full, but the elbow wants to bend and the mouth wants to chew and the brain needs more food. And so that's one thing. Right. Leptin resistance is causing that. And we can get into how to cure that. Um, and leptin, not to be confused with lectins being. So like L-E-P-T-I-N is the hormone? Leptin, L-E-P-T-I-N. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, yes. And then the other thing I want to say is artificial sweeteners help to break that um, gut brain connection as well. If you think about it, oh. the, the taste buds register um, what's coming and send signals down to the gut, up to the brain and then down to the gut saying like, let's say you drink a Diet Coke, right? Um, the taste buds say, ooh, big bolus of sugar coming, right? It's really sweet, right? That should be like a lot of calories, a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. And then nothing arrives. And over time, the stomach is like, yeah, I don't trust you. <laughs> You're so like, you're the boy who cried wolf, right? Yeah. And so artificial sweeteners, people who eat artificial sweeteners are likely to eat more later and more sugar later, in fact. Um, wow. So, yeah. So that, that um, the first um, leptin, the, the, the signaling, the, ba the bad signaling between the brain and the gut that you mentioned in the beginning, is that something people are born with or do they oh, no. get themselves into that uh, state and how do they get themselves into that state? You could be born without the gene that makes leptin and there's prader willi syndrome, but um, for 99, you know, plus percent of the population that has leptin resistance, um, it's like type two diabetes. You, you um, develop leptin resistance, like you develop um, poor insulin sensitivity, right? So it would be like the difference between type one and type two diabetes. So no, you're developing leptin resistance over time. And the way you get it is with um, developing high triglycerides, developing overall systemic inflammation, but especially inflammation of the hypothalamus, the, um, the little sort of um, uh, nodules in the brain that, that control your eating and other, your thirst and hunger and sex and other, other, uh, homeostatic type mechanisms like that. So inflammation there, which is correlated with just systemic inflammation, um, and, um, and high baseline insulin levels. So it's going to correlate actually with type two diabetes as well. Where do the emotions come in? Because I was expecting you to say, answer Dati's question with something like, well, it can be highly emotional um, at, or a lack of connection with other people. And is that, is that a simple eating disorder? And you're talking about food addiction? Is there, where's the difference? Okay, so those are lots of topics and they're separate. So, um, <laughs> uh, so emotional eating is cue driven eating where the cue is the emotion or the feeling, right? Um, but there, but most eating these days happens in response to a cue. It could be that you, you know, drive past a Starbucks and you always stop in there. So that's a location or time of day based cue. It could be 
that you eat when you're stressed or bored or you have something to celebrate, right? So there are emotion-based cues that go into eating, right? If you eat to stuff your feelings, then you might find that you're eating a lot over emotions, right? But really, emotions are just another form of a cue that we can be eating in response to. Um, So there's that. Eating disorders are, you know, whether it's restriction or purging or binging, um, research shows that about, about half of food addiction uh, goes along with an eating disorder and about half of eating disorders go along with food addiction and half doesn't, right? You can have one without the other. Um, so you could have anorexia and food addiction or anorexia without the food addiction. Um, yes, bulimia when it's active almost always goes along with food addiction. I would say binge eating disorder when it's active almost always. But then once the bulimia or the binge eating disorder is in remission, more like about 20% of the time, a food addiction still remains. Okay. So you mentioned these other disorders and the psychiatric associations, uh, diagnostic statistical manual known as to, to many people know as the DSM, they characterize these eating disorders and, 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 you know, certainly put them in, in variety of different categories of, you know, bulimia and binging and anorexia, orthorexia, food, there's a lot of them. And it doesn't include food addiction anywhere in this as a diagnosis. What, why is that missing? Do do we just not know enough yet? It seems like we do when we talk to you. Um, Yeah. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. No, great point. Yeah. Yeah. So what's happening is that um, just not yet. Um, there is an application that is about to be submitted to get it counted in the DSM. There's 400 scientific research publications that are part of that application. So that's the kind of size of the research, you know, body so far in support of food addiction. Um, The strongest research is in the neuroscience of food addiction strong enough that I don't know anyone who studies addiction in the brain who doesn't know that food addiction is real. It's, it's the evidence for it is overwhelming. If you look at a brain scan of the cocaine addicted brain, the heroin addicted brain, the food addicted brain, it's the same thing. And you can point to it on the scan. Actually, it's like circle it with a pen, you know, there it is right there. There's the dopamine down regulation and the nucleus accumbens. This brain is addicted to something and it might be sugar and flour, or it might be cocaine, or it might be Mm. something else. Right it's the same thing. So food addiction in the brain is a very real thing. And we know that, and it's not just the dopamine down regulation in the addiction reward centers, which by the way, what that means is that um, that part of the brain, the reward center of the brain has been so flooded by an unnatural um, wave of excess dopamine from eating things like donuts and pasta and pizza and chocolate and all these things that really our brains never were supposed to handle, right? I mean, donuts are the food equivalent of like pornography compared to sex, right? Compared to sex with your spouse, right? Um, Donuts are to real food, what pornography is to to real sex, right? Mm. Um, And the brain just just isn't supposed to have to handle um, a flood of stimulation like that. But with these processed foods, that's what we're giving it. Um, So it's not just that the dopamine floods in, then those receptors go, okay, that's excessive. We don't need anywhere near that much stimulation around here. So the receptors start to thin out, become less numerous, less responsive, which is fine if you keep eating donuts every day, right? If you keep going to, you know, swinging by the coffee shop, swinging through the drive-through, swinging through the convenience store, eating out of the vending machine. If you keep eating like that, and research shows that, among our kids and adolescents right now, two thirds of the food that they're eating is ultra processed food. That's exactly how they're eating. But if you stop eating that way, even for a few hours, what happens is you don't feel okay. You feel itchy, you feel restless, you feel irritable. um, And you're not going to feel okay because you don't have enough neurotransmitter on board just to feel normal. So you're not eating anymore to get high. You're eating to just to get through the day, just to feel normal. normal. So it's not just that. It's also 
um, increased Q reactivity. So when you see billboards or commercials or um, just the, the logo of your favorite fast food place or whatever it is, you're pulled in beyond what someone else would be. Um, it's also your brain has changed so that the anticipation of eating, the anticipation of that reward is really high, but when you eat, it doesn't satisfy, it doesn't give you the pleasure that it would for a regular and normal brain. Um, so all these brain changes happen. The evidence for that is overwhelming. Um, what we still don't have a lot of data on is um, treatment and recovery. And part of the challenge is that um, it's hard to have um, treatment centers and bona fide recovery approaches when food addiction isn't recognized as a, as a diagnosable condition who's treating it, right? So it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem. But we know that sex addiction is real and it's not in the DSM yet. We know that cell phone addiction and gaming gaming addiction is real. God knows we got teenagers holed up for, you know, wasting their whole life away on video games, not just teenagers. Uh, and that's not in the DSM. So the DSM is very behind in terms of acknowledging addictions that we know are real. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of it has to do with, we need more evidence around the treatment and the recovery. And, you know, with my work with Brightline Eating, I'm starting to provide some of those studies, um, but research takes time. So um, I would put personally, um, <clears throat> not great odds that this next application to the DSM will be accepted, but I would put pretty high odds that within 10 years, um, it will be in there. And, and I just want to say, you know, um, if your if your TV is out and there's no weather person saying it's hundred degrees out, you can step outside and still know it's hot, right? You don't need someone to tell you, (laughs) we don't need anyone to tell us that food addiction is real. That doesn't make it any more real or less real. It is what it is. And it'll take time for this particular body to acknowledge it. We talked a lot about this in our first uh, discussion with you on episode 10, Susan. You were hooked on crystal meth and crack cocaine. You're also a recovering food addict and a brain and cognitive scientist. Such an interesting mix. Um, <laughs> you, and so I think I, so I, th- I, I think you definitely qualify as an expert in this field. You believe that food is the hardest addiction to break. Why is that? I do. I do. And I do come from serious addiction um, myself. So those addictions were in my teenage years. You know, I started doing drugs when I was 14. And by the time I was 16, I was hooked on crystal meth. And I did crystal meth hard for a couple of years, dropped out of high school, developed drug induced psychosis, um, and then, you know, started freebasing cocaine and was addicted to crack cocaine and um, prostituted for quite a long time to satisfy that habit. And so from 14 to 20, I was addicted to drugs. And, you know, I, I feel like I go into that kind of graphic detail because when I say food is the hardest, I'm comparing it to something pretty hard, (laughs) you know, like that wasn't minor addiction. Like I lived for a long time without a key to a place that I lived in loops between the crack house and out to prostitute and back into the crack house, like heavy addiction and food has been harder for me by far. Um, you know, it's a lot easier to maintain the structures of a societally respectable life while you're heavily hooked on food. So it's not harder in that way, but it's harder to recover. It's harder to recover. And the reason it's harder, there's so many reasons. I go into like seven of them in my latest book, but um, just off the top of my head, um, nothing is socially pushed like food. You know, when I quit smoking crack, I had a lot of social support to not go back to that crack pipe. It is very hard to stay off of the addictive foods and addictive ways of eating in our society. Try saying no thank you to pumpkin pie on Thanksgiving and watch the pushback that you get, right? Um, when mm-hmm. for you, one is too many and a thousand is never enough, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard. So the cues to use are all over. You can't just even get to work without the billboards and the logos and the, yeah. the time of day cues where, you know, when I was smoking crack, I would smoke, you know, some, but, um, you know, I would frequently go two or three days before picking up the pipe again. But picture when you're hooked on food, 
there's really no place that you're free. You can't even go into a movie theater or like everywhere is a conditioned reinforcer for eating addictively work meetings. There's, you know, coffee with cream and sugar and bagels and Danish being passed around and every social gathering. Now there's another thing that makes food addiction hard, which is that with food addiction, not always, but usually there's weight gain that goes along with it. And then because of how our brain responds to sustained weight loss, when you get your food in order and you start losing weight, your brain uh, triggers hormonal changes that will push you back into your food addiction because the brain goes, you're starving, you're starving, and will we'll get you back to eating addictively hormonally. So your brain fights you. It's almost as if you were drinking alcohol. And what if drinking alcohol addictively and, and turning into an alcoholic over time created really bad acne on your skin. And then when you finally quit drinking, what if the one treatment for that acne caused cravings to drink alcohol again? It's like you're stuck in this loop. Once you've put on the weight, how do you get it off without trigger, triggering your food addiction again? The food industry is putting people in fMRI machines and making sure that their formulations taste-wise and their commercials are hitting the addictive centers in the brain maximally hard. So you've got a whole, you know, multi-billion dollar food industry um, against you. Like we don't have anywhere, the, cart the drug cartels don't have anywhere near that. And when it comes to cigarettes and alcohol, we have laws that protect children, for example, against alcohol and cigarette commercials, right? We don't let them advertise to the most vulnerable in our society. So, um, yeah, food is pushed and it's everywhere. And then the structural issue of you can't stop eating. So you have to engage with your drug and figure out the rules of engagement. And even with clear boundaries, like I give people in Brightline eating, no sugar, no flour, eat only meals, don't snack in between. Even with clear boundaries like that, it's not always easy to know what's the first addictive bite. If you're sitting there at a restaurant, you know, um, oh, is this sauce a little sweet? I don't, you know, kind of hard to tell. Um, have I just eaten a little bit too much beyond my quantity? And then once you're over the line and you feel like maybe you, you took a few too many bites, it can be very hard to know whether you're on your plan or off your plan, which creates psychologically the condition where you have to be in your groundest, authentic, highest self practically all the time to navigate those moments and say, look, you, you did fine, just don't eat anymore, right? Which is easy to say if you're in your a good place, but if you're triggered or you got three screaming kids and you're fighting with your spouse, it's much harder to not let that situation slip into an overeating situation and boom, you've just broken your your bright lines or your abstinence. Whereas it's a lot easier to just not drink a drink of alcohol because it's, you know, you don't ever have to order alcohol at the bar. So, oh my gosh, yeah. it's just the hardest. And there's, there's so many people, so many people that are extremely uh, successful in every aspect of their life, but they have a dysfunctional relationship with food. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's a coping mechanism. You can tell us, or dealing with, um, you know, extreme stress or or just uh, discomfort. Uh, I, I know for me that was the beginning of my anorexia. So when you when you have somebody that comes to you um, like that, what what are some alternatives that you know? I'm not saying this is a, an easy journey out of, but but that you suggest to them instead of using food. I mean, the, when when someone you sit down for the first time, they're like completely uh, addicted um, to food? Yeah. So um, the first step is really to get the food clear, right? Because mm -hmm. you need to know what you're doing with food. Um, it's sort of like you need to, you know, it's like, it's like the first step in alcohol recovery is you got to put down the alcohol, right? So getting a clear food plan and a commitment to that plan. And then once you're not eating addictively anymore, every emotion that comes up, you'll start to realize all the ways that you are coping with food. And then one day at a time, one meal at a time, you can de develop other strategies. So those strategies include- But, but let um, me go back. How do you yeah. arm them with that power? Like that's, you know, obviously sounds the easiest, but is not clear up the food, get rid of the addictive foods. I mean, that's the whole problem. Yeah. 
Well, right. So I give them a plan. I mean, that's what bright line eating is, is, okay. you know, here's, here's the food plan. It's a, it's a plan of food categories that you're going to eat and, and a structured meal plan of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then you can, so I give them a plan, like, here's the plan. Yeah. Right. And then when they want to have the donut, what, so, cause it's so emotional and so mental, right. right? Like not just, okay. Oh, that, Oh, I finally have a plan. Now I can just do it. No. Right. So, so one, yeah. so the first time like, Oh yeah, I'm supposed to eat the, you know, beans and rice and I ate the donut. Yeah. Like, how, what's the mental yeah. and, and emotional. Yeah. So change. let me actually, there's one additional step here, which is not just you have a food plan, but there's a way of engaging with food that involves writing down the night before what specifically you're going to eat. So so breakfast might be, you know, a protein, a grain and a fruit, and it's this, this much of each, right? Uh, well, great. But what are you eating tomorrow morning? And before you go to bed, you write it down. So I have my food written down for today already. This morning, I had, you know, one ounce of oats that I cooked up into oatmeal, I had six ounces of yogurt, that's a, a, a soy based yogurt that I make at home myself. I had one mm -hmm. ounce of ground flax seeds and I had six ounces of blueberries and raspberries. Okay. So I had that written down already last night before I went to bed and lunch and dinner as well. So now you're super clear. It's not just, there's a hypothetical plan. It's like, there's a specific plan for today. I've already thought through my day. I know whether I'm eating out or not. I know exactly what I'm eating. Okay. So then um, you can face the day and know, do I have to pack my lunch today? Like, where am I going? What am I doing? Right? So you're, you're planning for your food in advance and first when you're not in a triggered state. And so let's imagine you have a rough morning and you're really triggered. Well, your lunch is right beside you packed in a cooler bag. Right. And so now you've made the right thing to eat, the easiest thing to eat, and it's right there. So you've already increased your odds that you're sticking with your plan. And if you want to go through the drive-through anyway, now this is where you activate some sort of strategy. So we have people write out an emergency action plan. It's going to be a little different from everybody. For everybody, I'm an extrovert. Calling someone would be the number one thing on my emergency action plan, right? An introverted Christian might have pray to God and journal right? As their emergency action plan, what the first couple things that they're going to do, right? Get on my knees, pray to God. And, and if, if I still have a craving, grab my pen and write it out, right? So we have people write down an emergency action plan. That's going to be the first set of things, not just one thing, but a set of things that they're going to do. And we teach them scientifically what replenishes willpower. There are, there's about five things that scientifically replenish us, uh, restore us to a state of calm equanimity um, and ability to resist temptation and make self-empowered choices. Prayer, meditation, social support, gratitude. So literally you could be like grabbing a pen and writing a gratitude list. Um, or I have, you know, gone into the bathroom at a restaurant, right? And um, said a prayer, you know, sat down on the on the toilet and like, you know, set my phone timer for two minutes of deep breathing, like a little meditation app. Like there are absolutely things you can do in the moment, but you can see that there's a lot of preparation that has to come before with understanding a food plan and committing to what you're going to eat the night before that already gets you, I would say 80 to 90% of the way there in terms of being able to um, have a, a day in food recovery, as opposed to a day where you're going to be picking up a donut at some point. What is the fifth one? You know, you noticed, uh, I would, I'll have to think about that. Let's see if I can remember the fifth one. Um, Don't worry about it. We can just meditation, social support, um, gratitude. Oh, I remember it. <laughs> The fifth one is service, actually doing something for someone else. Get out of yourself like addiction and a craving. It's a very uh, self-absorbed state of mind. So you could stay at the table of that restaurant and just think service and then think, turn to the person next to you and say, how are you doing these days? What's got your attention in life right now? Right. And boom, the craving melts away. You thank you. Thank you for those. Those are so practical and doable for all of us in the moment. Um, mm -hmm. your, your book, Resume, talks about 
really talks about relapse. What you're speaking of now is how do we stay on plan? And you did a survey of your participants because you have a very large program of people who are food, who self-identify as food addicts um, called Brightline Eating. And you help them uh, deal with their food addiction and, and live, as you say in your book, happy, thin and free, um, your, for your first book. Um, and you found that 100% of them, when you did a survey of them, deviated from their food guidelines over time. And I thought this was so interesting because people think that I'm just going to be, that perfection is what I have to be. And if I go off it, then I'm a failure. And that often triggers people to actually go, you know, take 10 steps back. Yeah. Which is called the what the hell effect in psychology. There's papers published on it. It's like the, I've had a piece of pizza. I might as well eat the whole pizza. What the hell? And I'll start again on Monday. Yeah, totally. The adiposity set point is a, is a very real thing where the brain, once we've gained weight, um, the brain doesn't want to relinquish any weight ever. So unfortunately, you know, I mean, I think everyone knows this, right? This isn't the food environment that our brains, you know, uh, expect out there in the world. Our brains expect a food environment where getting enough food to eat is the one and only issue, right? And so in this particular food environment where weight gain is the bigger threat to our survival than, than malnutrition by a lot in most of the world now, and actually even in developing nations, um, obesity is a bigger concern than malnutrition everywhere in the world now, literally everywhere. Um, yes, there still is an issue. And I just lost my train of thought. What was the question again? Oh my gosh. Uh, is some part of our brain trying to keep us addicted? Yes. There still is an issue with um, our brain trying to drive us back up the scale. So once we achieve a certain weight, let's say 300 pounds, right? Um, everyone who's 300 pounds has 50 to 100 pounds to lose, if not more, right? Um, and yet take someone who's 300 pounds and have them lose 50 pounds healthily over time, their brain wants them to be 300 pounds again. And after they've lost a certain amount of weight, the brain will make adjustments. It will lower leptin so they won't, don't feel satisfied anymore. It will increase ghrelin, the hormone that makes you hungry. It will lower the thermostat so it will turn down thyroid hormone so that um, you're not burning as much, as many calories at rest and you're not, um, you're just the, the, you're, you're exhausted and your fuel centers aren't working as well to burn off calories. And all of those adjustments, there's more, there's like a whole slew of hormonal adjustments that the brain will make are aiming to drive you back up the weight scale. The brain doesn't really recognize that you're overweight and that's not healthy. The brain just knows extended weight loss is problematic we need you to be heavier again. And so there are a few things you can do um, to, to trick the brain essentially to uh, allow you to lose weight without fighting you as hard. And one of the biggest ones that people don't realize is keeping your food simple is one of the number one things, whole real foods and simple foods. So when you're eating brown rice and broccoli, your brain is going to let you lose your weight. When you're eating one point brownies, you know, or, you know, fake shakes. And this is why in bright line eating, there's no fake foods. There's no, uh, yeah, there's, there's just, there's no artificial sweeteners. There's none of that stuff because the sexiness of the tastes and the the recipes and all that stuff, it doesn't, the brain doesn't calm down. It, it keeps you uh, needing to gain back your weight again. Yeah. It, it, it certainly seems like you crave what you eat. I know I've found that to be the case. And I remember when I was in treatment, telling my therapist that I would not, you know, I'm giving her the rules, right? I would not consider myself well or healed or better, uh, unless I could eat or try or taste any food in the whole wide world. Like I didn't want to have, I was already restrictive. That was the problem. Right. I didn't want to have restrictions. Food rules. Yeah. No food and we rules. finally got there. Right now. And it, so it was, you know, as you said before, there are certainly crossovers with restrict restrictive eating. Um, and, uh, 
and, and overeating and food addiction. I mean, there, there, there definitely are crossovers and it did turn into bulimia. So there was crossovers, but I did finally get there, but what I, to, to be able to have, you know, in any, whatever, if it's a donut or this yeah. or that, but eating whole real foods is, is, is really what was the uh, unlocking the key because now I crave what I eat. And the other day my husband went and got two vegan donuts from this woohoo, you know, vegan donut place. And on Monday, on Friday, we still had half of, we, just two donuts, half of one of them in the refrigerator. I was like, this is probably stale by now. But I was like, that, that That's it's not, I don't, it's just not, it's too, it was too sweet, right? It was cr- used in the day. Oh my gosh, right? They would have been gone in 50 seconds and down and thrown back up probably. But it's just, the craving is just gone for, yeah. for, for that, for fake foods. Yeah. yeah. So interesting. So a few things to say, first of all, um, we have lots and lots and lots and lots of people in bright line eating who will claim that they have never broken their bright lines. And, and on the surveys, um, they have, here's, here's what the surveys asked, um, over the last week, um, on a scale from one to four, with four being absolutely perfect, right? How mm-hmm. well did you keep the bright line for, for no sugar, right? Four being absolutely no sugar. Uh, on a scale from one to four, where, with four being perfect, how well did you keep the bright line for flour? On a scale from one to four, how well did you keep the bright line for meals? In other words, eating only your three meals a day or your two meals a day or your five meals a day if you've had bariatric surgery and you need more meals or whatever and never a bite in between. And on a scale from one to four, how well did you keep your line for quantities? Meaning you weighed and measured your food, you ate only in exactly the right amount. Now, um, we don't necessarily weigh and measure our food in a restaurant. And so there are Mm -hmm. people who not being perfect means that that week they went to a buffet or to a potluck or whatever, and they gave themselves three out of four for the quantities line because they're not 100% sure that at that particular meal, their quantities were exactly spot on, right? That's what, and so they still counted that as a bright day. No sugar, no flour, their three meals, and they ate out, they did their best they could, the best they could with their quantities, but they counted it as a three out of four. And so the point I'm making is that, and this is a big point that I make in the book, Resume, you can, stay abstinent or bright in terms of your food addiction recovery completely and count it like in AA, you might say, I have five years sober, right? Say I have five years following bright line eating, or I have five years of back-to-back food abstinence or whatever you're saying. And you're still going to be fluctuating a little bit with the sine wave of lapsing a little bit here and there, maybe, um, maybe you're relying on bigger fruit, like you get an apple at lunch, but you're for, for whatever reason, you're picking the biggest apples, right? And then other times you're like, look, I don't need an apple the size of a baby's head. I'm just a regular apple is fine, right? You're still going to be lapsing a little bit and then coming back to, you know, a better place because life cycles, right? And for people who have a pretty severe food addiction, what I try to encourage them to do is watch your habits and your social support because those things are going to lapse first and then your food is going to lapse after you've been in a relapse cycle with your habits and your social support. Eventually, it'll hit your food. Once you're in a food routine, it's it, it can be pretty automatic to keep it up, right? Um, but so anyway, it doesn't. It, you know, we have tons of people, they call themselves crystal vasers, because I say, you know, once you've gotten your bright lines intact, it's like you have a beautiful crystal vase, don't drop it, it'll shatter, it'll never go back the same way that it was. You know, there's lots of people with crystal vase recovery and bright line eating. Um, so it's not like they've broken their crystal vase, it's more like there's that tiny little lapse, and then they get back on track. But what I want to say about what you were talking about, Dotsie, about the, the, the donut in the, in the refrigerator is, I don't know how addicted to food you, you certainly, it it sounds like back in the day had, Mm -hmm. had a food, a full-blown food addiction, but you might have a brain that's only moderately addicted 
in mm-hmm. addictable in general, right? Not as bad as some of us are. And so when your when your eating disorder was treated, you are able now to go back to sugar and flour in moderate quantities if you want to. Mm-hmm. For some people, that's never going to be an empowered choice, right? Mm-hmm. It's going to be like, you know, and I know people that I knew in a 12 step drug and alcohol program years ago who drink sometimes now. And, and, you know, they, they tied one on with me in our teens, but now they drink occasionally. I, I don't go back to alcohol. You know, I have 28 years clean and sober and drinking alcohol is not an empowered choice for me today. Right. So I just want to emphasize that entire abstinence from whatever used to be problematic really is an empowered choice for a lot of people, for a lot of substances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. It, 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 it makes me think about, um, yes, so, so much so about how the brain, um, communicates with our decisions, um, and, and pushing us toward decisions and, and, um, some close friends that definitely have um, food addiction that this episode is going to help so much with, because it, it might just not be an option. And I I think it it seems like it's a combination of not as addictive of a brain than I used to have. And so much real food that my body is also it's, it's craving what I'm eating, craving what I like. It wants more and more and more of, of that um, than the other, which leads us to, which is just right down this alley of the four questions about um, that you share about how to know if what we were eating is helping us with our addiction or not helping us. Will you share those? Yeah, yeah, totally. So um, the first one is, do I have peace around it? Right? Because a lot of the addiction is the, the mental rigmarole, the food, the mental chatter. I I like to think of my food these days as it plays the same role in my life as a hot shower. So when it's mealtime, I eat my meal. I love my meal. It's delicious. And just like a hot shower, uh, it's a fabulous part of my day, but I'm not thinking about it a lot ahead of time. I'm not thinking about it afterwards, how it went and whether it went okay. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) you know what I mean? Like it's done, it's dusted, it's over. Right. And so if, if my food is climbing into my head and I'm thinking about it during my meditation and while I'm driving my car, what I'm going to eat or what I have eaten, that's not peace. And I don't want food to be uh, running, you know, renting space in my mind like that. So that's number one. Do you have peace around it? Number two, is it healthy, right? Because we want to maximize, you know, feeding our bodies in ways that are healthy. Uh, number three, is it messing with my weight? right? If we have habits or ways that we're eating that are making our weight deviate from what is, you know, a right size body for us and our genetics and our health, then that's an issue. Um, And number four, is it escalating? So we can run an experiment with our food and think, oh, I'll try this. And then we think it's going to be an exception. And then we kind of we're thinking about it a lot. And then we want some the next day. And then, you know, like that vegan donut, right? If, if it had stayed in the fridge, fine. But then what if like the next week you thought, oh, there's that vegan donut place. And then you got another one. And then the next week, twice you went and got the vegan donut, right? And so if it's escalating, then that's a red flag as well. So do I have peace around it? Is it healthy? Is it messing with my weight? And is it escalating? Those are the four questions. And those help you aim for what you call in your book, food neutrality, right? Yes, exactly. That's the hot shower metaphor. It's like, you know, it's not, it's not asceticism. It's not, I, I, I'm eating, you know, cardboard and, you know, I don't enjoy it. And I don't, you know, it's not that it's, it's, I love my meals. They're fabulous. And I'm not thinking about them or obsessing about them before or after it's a wonderful part of my life, but it's not it's not ruling or dictating my life. And I'm, yeah, I have food neutrality. Mm-hmm. So you're planning them, but you're not obsessing. Cause I know you're planning the day before, like you planned yeah. last night, what was for breakfast. So that yeah. does require some thinking about food, but it's, there's a difference between the planning and then uh, uh, obsessing about when that's you're gonna oh, yeah. eat it and what it's going to be like. And okay. And how do you no help people? Than- there's a bit, there's a big difference, but there also can be very intertwined. Yeah, not really. When you get used to it, what, what at the beginning, it can be very hard to plan your food because, um, 
it can be so you, the, the, the fear of like, well, what if this isn't what I feel like eating tomorrow, yeah, you know? Right. Um, and what I teach people is stick to what you committed. And if, if at the moment you think, but I feel like asparagus, I committed broccoli, but I, the, but the, I just got the asparagus from the farmer's market and it's right here and it's, it's, but I say, just write it down for tomorrow. The asparagus will be there tomorrow, have it yeah. for tomorrow. And it really is important to break the, um, the tendency that our society builds up of like having a brain that's constantly thinking, uh, what would hit the spot? What do I feel like eating right now? What would, you know, what, what's going to do it for me? What would hit the spot? Breaking that association is really important. And so when you are following the bright line eating food plan, which is, it's a plug and play kind of plan where there's categories, right? So you're, for breakfast, you're going to have you know, a grain, a protein and a fruit, that's what you're going to start out with. And so you get into a, into a rhythm, right? Like, you know, what, what are, what's your protein going to be? It's either going to be nuts or it's going to be seeds or it's going to be yogurt, you know, yogurt or whatever it's going to be. Um, and so when you're writing down your food the night before, it's sort of like when you've dressed your body enough times, picking out your clothes the night before, you know, it shouldn't be that big of a deal, right? Like you can just, you know, Anyway, it, it, it gets pretty easy. That's the automation part, which you encourage people to get into sort of without having to think once you've committed to it. Now you don't have to think about your food and you just do it, which helps yes. you get out of that addiction brain. We had a guest on and Totsi, unfortunately, was unable to be um, co-hosting the show that day. And she was talking about eating disorders. I can't remember if it was the author of uh, Processed Food Addiction, the Processed Food Addiction book. I don't think so. But she got very annoyed at me because I asked about the food environment and how to make it work for us instead of against us and how to cultivate strong habits around food. And she said, No, it's not about the food. I shouldn't have to do any of that. If I was truly healed of my disordered eating, I should be able to have a candy on my desk and not eat it if I didn't didn't, uh, feel like I should eat it. Um, Now, maybe she was talking about it just as eating disorder and not addiction. Structure is helpful. Structure is helpful, especially when addiction is, is in play. Structure can produce a lot of freedom, right? In terms of the food environment, I'm with you that, you know, you want to clean up your food environment as much as possible. If you live alone, get all the foods that you don't eat out of your house. There's no need to have, you know, just like if you're a recovering alcoholic, there's no need to have a full liquor cabinet if you live alone, right? If guests come over, they can bring their own bottle of wine, right? Just tell them, hey, I don't have any liquor in my house. So it's a BYO situation. Um, uh, Yeah, so I wouldn't have candy on my desk. first of all, it's not helping me and it's not helping anyone else either. I think we need to understand a little bit that having the current food environment, it's not helping any of us. Like, oh my gosh, obesity rates are climbing unabated. Like we're about to discover, mark my words, we're about to discover that we've hit 50% obesity in the United States. We were 42.4% in 2018. And that was before COVID right? And 42% of people gained an average of 19 pounds in the first year of COVID. I'm pretty sure that means we're at 50% obesity right now, right? Two thirds, 70% overweight or obese, 50% flat out obese. Like when are, when are we going to cry uncle? Yeah. When someone moves into the neighborhood, don't bake them a pie, bring them fresh flowers. Like we're, we're in a world now where we need to understand that our current food environment isn't serving any of us. So yeah, get those candies off your desk for your sake and theirs, right? So um, yeah, have, have, you know, if you want to do something nice for your colleagues, you know, yeah, buy, buy a, a bunch of different colored roses and hand one to each person who comes to your desk. It'll be much more refreshing and much more delightful. And anyway, so yeah, I mean, I do think that when you have true food neutrality, you can go anywhere and socialize in any way and you don't have to worry about the food because it's not your food. It's, you know, you, you know what you're going to eat and it's not that stuff, you know, your food is planned. So you can, you know, there is a certain level of freedom. So I kind of see it both ways, but the automaticity that you brought up is um, it's key. The automaticity is what allows us to navigate the willpower gap, which is this, this 
this gap where we intend to eat a certain way and then suddenly we find ourselves ordering a pizza on Friday night yeah. because we're stressed, we're overwhelmed, and we know pizza isn't what feels good to eat and it's not on our plan, but we're ordering a pizza. That is what happens when you don't have automaticity with your food. You don't have a structured enough plan to already know what's for dinner and to already be making it while you're arguing with your spouse, while you're dealing with the kids and you know whatever. With automaticity on board, you get a brain that's like the brain that has you brushing your teeth, whether you're traveling or you've been out for a New Year's Eve party and it's now two in the morning and you're about to go to bed. Um, I don't know about you, but I still brush my teeth. Like I brush my teeth before I go to bed, no matter what I brush my teeth, even if I'm sick, even if I don't feel like it, it's got nothing to do with my mood or anything. Before I go to bed, I brush my teeth. And that's automaticity, right? That's a different part of the brain than the brain that's making choices and deciding what it feels like doing. If I decided what I, whether I felt like brushing my teeth, I would brush my teeth seldom, frankly, right? Um, so- Alexander would brush hers like every other minute. She <laughs> loves it. <laughs> I, does, I brush my teeth all the time. It's true. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so you you talk about automo uh, you talk about automaticity. Did I say that right? Automaticity yeah. and yeah. ritual in your book, and the importance yeah. of both. They sound the same, but they're different, aren't they? Yeah, I think um, I think of automaticity, we can have automaticity with brushing our teeth, with our food. Ritual, I think of more in terms of habit stacks, in terms of morning routines and evening routines. It's like doing the same thing in the same way. And I think some people do have those routines dialed in to the point where a lot of automaticity is in play. Um, so I think a ritual is a more elaborate thing and over time you can develop some automaticity with it, but I teach people to set up a morning habit stack and an evening habit stack. So a habit stack, meaning, uh, a series of behaviors. They're, these are like self-care behaviors, like meditating, writing a gratitude journal, exercising, um, you know, uh, um, at night, um, writing in a five-year journal, um, doing some yoga stretches, you know, whatever it is. Right. Um, and I have people build those routines slowly over time. And really you can get to the point where by a pretty early hour in the morning, you've done a lot of your daily self care and you've just done it the same way every time so that it's, it's pretty automatic. Yeah. You get it really dialed in. Mm -hmm. In your experience, can food addicts ever end up having any joy around food? Yeah. Oh, yeah. have I not made that clear? Yeah, absolutely. No. That's the hot shower <laughs> analogy. I love my hot showers and I love my meals and I enjoy going out to eat and I absolutely love total joy in eating. Absolutely. So can a food addict healthily have joy in their eating and around their food? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, is there a way that we have as a society lifted up eating and food beyond, oh, you know, beyond what we should, beyond what's healthy, beyond what's serving us, absolutely. And what I think happens when you're in recovery or you start to think of food in a more healthy way is you realize that we are, a lot of us, using food in ways that it, it's not the best tool for that job, right? Food is a yes, poor proxy yes. for connection. It's a poor proxy for love. It's a poor proxy for welcome to the neighborhood. It's a poor proxy for comfort. It's a poor proxy for celebration, right? Like if you think about, you got to put the celebration in the celebration. Can you have food there? Absolutely. Can you pay some attention to what food it is and make sure, you know, to pay, take some care? Yes. But if that's all you're providing, the person's not going to feel celebrated. The event is not going to feel that joyous, right? Food is a poor proxy for a lot of things. And if you think about a family that's eating together, but, um, but food is really their love, that's a sad state of affairs, right? Because the real conduits to love are eye contact, you know, touch like an arm on a shoulder, um, laughter, um, 
like verbal connection, you know, uh, how are, how are you doing? How did that job interview go? How was your, you know, like the ways we need to be connecting when we're that keyed into our food, we're missing out. It really isn't the best tool for most of those jobs. So when we get our food in its place, then we focus more on life. And a good example is Thanksgiving. You know, I, I have only eaten sugar and flour once in uh, 19 years of Thanksgivings. I, had, I, was, I was in a relapse mode um, a few years ago and only once on Thanksgiving uh, did I actually eat addictively. The other 18 out of the last 19 Thanksgivings, I've stuck with my food plan. That means no sugar, no flour, like a real, you know, weighted measured meal, like, you know, and I love Thanksgiving and I connect with people on Thanksgiving and I, all of the holiday good vibes of Thanksgiving are there for me on that day. I wake up and I connect with people and I, I'm thinking about the human interaction. I'm thinking about thanks and giving. I'm thinking about gratitude and service, being there for the people that I'm with and reconnecting with them and celebrating our relationship and our family. That's what the holiday is about, right? Just to be clear, I serve all kinds of other foods on Thanksgiving. If I'm hosting, there's a smorgasbord there of other foods that I'm not eating. I'm just picking, you know, my protein and my vegetable and my salad and my grain, you know. Um, Anyway, it's not like, like my kids aren't deprived of, you know, mashed potatoes and pie and, you know, crackers and all the things, right? Whatever. We'd like you just to share with our audience about your Brightline eating program and where people can find you. Yeah, absolutely. So people can find me at brightlineeating.com. So it's B-R-I-G-H-T-L-I-N-E, brightlineeating.com. And um, the program is incredible. We've got a bright roadmap where we take people through a full journey, not just losing their excess weight, getting food freedom, um, but maintaining it over the years and doing real deep inner work of healing on their food journey. Um, it's There's a lot of community and connection involved, a lot of resilience against relapse that's built in. Um, and yeah, true, true healing and integration, right? Because you can't stick with a food plan if you're still needing to eat addictively over wounds and traumas and so forth. So it's an incredible community and we publish our research. So we have research showing that, for example, someone starting Brightline Eating is going to lose, oh, just about four to five times more weight than they would if they started Noom um, over the the initial period. And they're going to keep it off better than any other program with published results in the known universe. Mm -hmm. Um, And over those first couple months, their hunger and their cravings levels are going to go down to negligible levels. So they're not going to be doing it while they're hungry still or craving food still. It's going to become truly easeful and neutral for them. Um, We have data that we published showing that no matter their age, they're going to lose weight equivalently. I mean, literally, we take a postmenopausal woman in her 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and she's going to lose weight as fast as a woman in her 20s or 30s. Um, And how that's possible is when you take sugar and flour out of the equation, it stops mattering whether you have as much estrogen on board to facilitate your Mm -hmm. insulin response, right? So it levels the playing field in terms of age. Um, And we also have data published showing that people's uh, uh, days of poor mental health reduce, their depression reduces, their uh, energy increases, their feeling of wellness and vitality increases, their happiness increases, their feeling of perceived social support skyrockets. Um, it, it is a, a totally holistic um, program that just boosts someone's well being across the board, pretty much. Um, it's affordable and it's fun and it's very scientifically grounded. Um, and it's at brightlineeating.com. So mm. if you, if that, if all that sounds good, join us. It's amazing. <laughs> is that on that site? Where can people find the questionnaire? on if they are a food addict. Yeah. So at the, at the very, very bottom of that site, there's a quiz link. Um, but you can also go to foodfreedomquiz.com, foodfreedomquiz.com. Straight there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed that one of your frequently asked questions when I was looking is, uh, from people is, do I have to exercise? 
Yeah. Maybe they're going to want to start exercising once they've, they've done the program, well, but what do you the say? answer is the answer is no. Um, and actually if someone's not exercising now, we actively recommend that they not, um, oh. do not start exercising when you're starting bright line eating or any food program. And the reason is that food is the linchpin. Um, exercise does not make people lose weight. Exercise helps them be healthy and you should be exercising eventually, but initially give yourself and your brain a good set of months to make bright line eating automatic before you're adding exercise into the mix. Otherwise, what happens is you set up food cravings and you set up the compensation effect where a brain that's exercising is thinking, oh, well, I worked out four times this week so I can go through the drive through It's going to mess up the automaticity of your food program. So focus on the food first and give exercise a rest until you're really established with bright line eating. So literally you get a free pass. The hall pass will expire eventually, mm-hmm. yeah. but um, initially, initially <laughs> it's better actually if you don't exercise. Yeah. 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 And when it's all of it's in alignment with your, with your eating and the, and, and the lack of the food addiction showing up and, and moving your body, uh, the drive-through just doesn't seem that exciting anymore or the eventually. non-reward that you're going to get yeah. eventually. Yeah. 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 That's the goal. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, incredible. So Thanks for visiting us again. It was so sweet to be back with you. Thanks for having me back. It's delightful. Thank you so much, Alexandra and Dotsy. Really. Back by very popular demand is our plant-powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.